Hi, so today we have questions from Naomi, Charles, Kathy, and Cassie. And Naomi asks, can I use video and pictures to teach my child in order to engage her? Well, video and pictures are great things to be using as part of your child's learning. The only thing I would say is that it's really important to be talking to your child about them. So we know from research on toddlers TV, for example, that it can be educational, but only if mum, dad, or the caregiver is sat next to the child talking about what's on the TV with the child. And the sorts of questions which are good to strike up a, a helpful conversation are the sorts of questions beginning with WH. So what's that? Who's that? You know, where's that going? Uh, we tend to find those sorts of questions are, are really supportive of, of children's learning in the, in the early years. So Charles has asked, my child has ADHD. Is this advice applicable for us as parents? Uh, yes, it, it, it certainly is. Um, scientists tend to think about ADHD now as an, an underfunctioning of the reward system. So a child with ADHD is going to respond to their, re their reward system in their brain is going to respond to exactly the same sorts of things as everybody else's does, but just not quite so, so strongly sometimes. So that means that uh, you often have a shorter span of attention. And that means shorter term activities, shorter term targets. But thinking about some of the things that we've talked about on the site, like uh, rewards, praise, um, you know, sticker charts, games, choice, uh, working with other people, novelty, all of those things uh, are going to apply equally well to a child with ADHD. But it may need a, a greater turnover of, of variety and, and, and more rewards, more novelty. Um, more curiosity needed, needed to inspire, um, but essentially all, all the same things apply. Kathy asks, what is the ideal length of a classroom lesson for a teenage brain and why? Okay, so we're all different. Um, our brains are different in terms of what things engage us and how well we can control our attention. Um, but so therefore, you know, it's not so much that there's an ideal length of a, of a lesson. But what is important uh, is to be monitoring how well somebody is engaging with their learning and perhaps having conversations uh, with your teenager about that and finding a schedule that's appealing for them and that they think uh, will engage them. And the sorts of things to think about are when you start and stop the learning sessions uh, the breaks that you have, um, the sorts of rewards that might be introduced along the way just to keep everybody going, um, and, and also how you mix up the topics. So we know that spacing your learning out can be really effective. So, you know, a few rapid breaks every now and then, um, but also interleaving learning. So swapping from one topic to the next, not so much that it's confusing, but enough for it to add some sort of variety so you don't get bored too quickly. Now, as to when you start the learning sessions, that can be a bit more tricky with teenagers. We know that their sleep cycles become disrupted uh, around about adolescence. So there is a delay that opens up uh, between the morning arriving and your brain waking up and the nighttime coming down and you wanting to go to sleep. So there is a case for saying that teenagers can actually function better if they start their learning a little bit later in the morning, say 10 o'clock. Um, that is an argument. That's something perhaps you could discuss with your teenager. Uh, but of course, there are other issues to bear in mind. Uh, I tend not to do that because I find it disrupts everybody else. It's just so much easier if everybody is in the same sort of um, routine as to when they're starting their working day. So it's again, it's something to be negotiated. And the more role that your teenager has in deciding their own schedule, uh, the more successful that schedule is likely to be, really. Um, so... Cassie asks, what effect does being off school have in the summer on learning? Well, quite a, a big effect, actually. Of course, it all depends on what the child is doing at home. And it's been shown that some children who are quite active readers actually go back to school better readers than when they broke up for the summer holidays. But in other areas, such as maths and spelling, 
learning gets lost. So in a study in the United States, they have three month summer holidays there. And they found that the spelling lost was actually about four months. So it took another four months after the children arrived back after the summer for their spelling to catch up to where they were before the summer break. So I think all that is telling us that the work that you're doing at the moment in supporting your children's learning is really, really important. There are children who are not learning at home now and those children will probably spend a lot of next year just trying to catch up to where they were a few weeks ago. So, you know, keep up the good work. Um, you're doing a great job and please do post in any more questions online and I will try to respond to them um, as best I can to, to help you.